Sandy Dressler and Carmen Sears are the Program Director and Clinical Director of Orlando Youth Advocate Programs, Inc. They're joining me today to share how the organization provides at-risk youth with community-based alternatives. does the organization provide our Central Florida residents? Sure. So Youth Advocate Programs uh, has been around since 1975. It was established in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania by Tom Jeffers. And the mission has always been to keep youth out of placements that can look in many ways, right? It could be incarceration, it could be child welfare, uh, any type of institution. Keep them in their communities where they will best thrive with their families. And that is the same mission and vision that we have here locally. We partner with several community agencies that filter through their most um, cases that are in crisis, those families, and we begin working with them. We serve them anywhere from 12 to 15 hours per week. So it is an intensive type of advocacy and wraparound service. Um, we don't call it mentoring because again, we do so much more than that. And as we continue to you know, explore what we do a little bit more, we'll get into a little bit more of the details. But in a nutshell is that we are holding hands with our community partners to prevent children from going into the foster care system or any other type of um, incarceration. And we provide the therapies in the most natural environment, like at home, at school, if possible. Yes. Right now, currently, we do not contract with Orange County Public Schools, but we do the Dry County and we do all the private schools and they care and provide the therapy also at the office if the parent requires to come to the office. Right. Sometimes we have provided therapy in um, doing when they go to DJJ. Uh, unfortunately, that is rare, but we have done it. Mm -hmm. So at the most natural place where the client is, and of course, we always try to prevent the client from going to any kind of institution so that they can stay in home and in their community. Right. So both programs complement each other very nicely, right? It's, it's more of that one-stop shop, and a lot of the families feel comfortable with that. It's a little bit more organic, right, because you have your team uh, that is caring for your family, for your youth, in one place, and we're constantly communicating. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about the advocate model. The YAP RAP model, advocacy model, is very organic in the sense that we higher from within the community where our families live, right? So it's that peer-to-peer -peer connection. They're coming from the same zip codes, right? They're able to identify. Many times even our advocates have lived through several experiences, right? Or were that child, right? That youth um, that needed these types of services, right? When they were growing up. So they're able to communicate, to identify with the parents, to walk that walk, you know, with them. Uh, and parents really gravitate towards that simply because here is someone, right, has the lived experience, not just the textbook, right, not just the training, but is able to identify with me, right? Um, so again, it's, it's very holistic, right, from the ground up, available 24 seven, right? It's more of that relationship building, right, from day one. Okay, from the day that we do that intake, which is immediate within 24 hours, we're already engaging the family in those conversations of how does normalcy look for you? You're the expert of your family, right? Um, and, and that's what that advocacy model is, you know, pretty much fostering all of that wraparound, right? But at, at the same time, building on that connection with the family. And for us, um, a lot of the clients that are on program, mm -hmm. uh, the advocacy program also have therapy services. So what we do is we're part of the wraparound services that inclu includes that child, mm -hmm. but, and that whole family. But sometimes we have children that, uh, because uh, I think uh, I'll say 80% of my population are kids that are removed or in danger of being removed because they're DCF referrals. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we work with the foster parents, the potential uh, adoption if the kid is gonna be adopted, and of course the biological parents to have that child in a better situation. Mm -hmm. And so, but the therapist being involved with all these entities, you know, the case manager, the foster, the biological, mm -hmm. and the potential adoptive, the child has a better chance of, uh, chance of adjusting. Right. 
stability. Mm -hmm. That's what we want to gain, right? Depending on what avenue that you've got to us or that family, obviously every case, as complex as it can be, it's very individualized. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the, the program as well, right? No two uh, shoes fit the same. So every family receives that individualized, you know, treatment plan or care, level of care. And then we start pulling into the community and building those support systems, right? That's part of building that family team. You have the professional supports and then you have their family supports, right? Their community supports. And we identify those and help them kind of grow. Like you're them. building that village. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Why is it important that families have a voice in your service plan? They're their experts. They know you know, what they want, right? And one of the first questions, you know, when we go in and, and begin these conversations with them is what's going on? You know, how did we get here? What do you envision to get out of this, right? And how are we going to do this together, right? We need to also educate them at the end of the day to advocate for themselves, right? Because most of the time when our families, you know, enter a courthouse, right, or a doctor, there is, you know, that apprehension of not speaking the same language, right? Cultural biases. So when we start to break down those barriers and empower the families to speak up. That's part of building that relationship, right? Why? Because when we begin to transition, right, out of their lives, we want to leave them with those tools, right? To feel empowered, to speak up to themselves and to connect to those community resources should they fall into the same situation they were in, right? So to troubleshoot. So yes, it, it's many, many arenas that we're tapping into under that advocacy hat empowering education, right? Um, connecting them to the resources is so, so, so critical, right? Many social services are out there, but we don't see them on TV, right? So if there, it isn't by word of mouth, if it isn't by shows like yours, Ms. Emily, or agencies coming together, right? The more power that we can get out to the families, the better it's going to be for the outcomes of our children, correct? So. And in our case, we insist Mm -hmm. Because the, a lot of the problems that we see, unfortunately, is the lack of family involvement. Right. So what we do is we integrate the family into the treatment of the child and the treatment plan because it's extremely important. The child will get better and will move on the right direction at school and in whatever it is that the child is um, dealing or, or living mm -hmm. uh, when the family is involved. Right. And the other providers, too, you know, making them accountable, saying, listen, let's work in partnership. At the end of the day, it's for the well-being of this family, of this youth, right, which will foster productivity in the community. So it will affect all of us at the end of the day. What can someone participating in your services expect? What does the process look like? Yeah. So... Upon receiving, you know, that call from one of our referring authorities, we already know that the case is going to be very complex um, because those are the type of partnerships that we have. These are, you know, families that perhaps have fallen through the cracks, you know, and has escalated, right, to a higher point that maybe they seem like, you know what, there's kind of no way out. So it's a very intense, right, type of relationship that we begin right away. And that's why it's so crucial within those 24 hours to get a hold of them, right? And put aside the paperwork. Let me learn about you. How did we get here? So even if it starts with just a phone call, and then going to meet them, you know, thereafter. But at least giving them that option. Do you want to see me in person? We can do it virtual now, right? Any of those platforms, maybe out in the community. Giving them that choice, right? Because again, they know what's best for them. And remember, chances are a lot of the families that end up working with us have been through the system, have met with many social workers and many other programs. So to them, you know, it might feel you're just one more. So we need to break down those barriers, right? If they don't want to talk to us and they want to have a small conversation, guess what? We do that. We don't force them. And then we call again, you know. So again, meeting the families where they are at. And again, depending on the situation of the case, acting immediately. Some of them are in crisis, right? So we need to jump right in into what are those immediate needs and connecting them, right? And satisfying those needs or helping them do that. Others have a little bit more of that long term, you know, type of situation that gives us more of that chance to say, okay, let's go in, let's start building that report slowly, especially with the youth, you know? Uh, 
implementing that advocacy right away, right? So when we do the intake, we bring the advocate to the table. We don't want to, right? That trauma of meeting a new person. No, nope, come on in. We're part of the team now. And we start explaining it to them and gathering information. Our process is a long one. This is not, you know, one hour a week, once a week. No, we see our families three times a week, sometimes more, for 12, 15 hours. So you see the level of building of that relationship? We're able to transport, right? If they have to go to court, if that youth has doctor's appointments, removing that burden from that family, right? Mm -hmm. Giving them that helping hand. Because many of our families, like I said, because their cases are so complex, they might be at risk already of losing their job because they continuously have to be calling out, right? To address the needs of their child. Uh, or, you know, um, they're at risk of losing their housing, right? Because of the lack of work, no money to pay the rent. So many circumstances. So when we start doing that with them of saying, listen, we're not here to create a burden. We're here to help. How can we help you? Mm -hmm. Well, I need you to take so-and-so to a doctor's appointment. Help me go do groceries. Let's do it. So again, the service looks however the family wants it to look. And for us, our uh, referral process comes from the community, people actually call the office and say, I need my child in therapy, mm -hmm. or it comes from school or word of mouth or DCF, like I said, mm -hmm. the doctors, sometimes we have the pediatricians call our office and send the referral, and we turn around 24 to 48 hours. Mm -hmm. Our families only get one hour a week, but, um, and when it's needed, when the child needs more than that, it, it's up to two hours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we uh, match the therapies based on distance, um, cultural affinity, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and language. How do you first connect with those who need your services? Good. Mm -hmm. So um, the families call our office directly when they need it. The pediatricians call us or the school sometimes, even though we don't have a contract, the school can call directly. And of course, from the referring authorities and sometimes saying it's uh, how right. the clients and they need services and so pretty much from the whole community. Mm -hmm. We don't have, uh, we do not at this point, uh, well, the only thing that we do is we do have tables at events and stuff, but we do not um, solicit the service per se, but we get the referral from when mm -hmm. they call. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of avenues, um, thankfully, you know. In our case, because again, it's a more of a very intensive, streamlined type of service, we have um, partnerships and collaborations with several agencies, you know, in the community that kind of funnel through those crisis, you know, cases that they come across. And we are part of the diversion and prevention department with our lead child welfare agency that um, handles circuit nine. And we partner with them in that, in the prevention, right? And diverting of those youth from going into the system. So for them, it might look and the call to them might be coming from the Department of Juvenile Justice, right? We might have a child that is crossing over, involved in child welfare, but at the same time has probation. Uh, or from a judge, you know, that that parent says, you know what, um, I, I don't want any thing else to do. So we go ahead and we intervene at that stage as well. Uh, we have placement stabilization as well. So this may be a youth that perhaps um, has been adopted, right? But there is some risk of that perm permanency to be disrupted. So again, it, it could look very different, um, but it is from child welfare. Uh, and we do have, like I said, those partnerships in the community with um, other agencies. Yes. How can the community support your efforts? That is a very good question. Mm -hmm. We have, um, currently we have several therapies in different languages. We have Portuguese, Haitian Creole, Spanish, and English, but the community could support us by pretty much that, you know, uh, uh, get gathering providers that speak other languages. As Central Florida has more and more languages going along due to the immigration right. situation, that would be one thing. The other thing, it could be about, you know, community awareness. I think that is huge. Right. Um, absolutely. We're a community-based agency. The, the services that we provide, you know, are uh, in the community and we need to become one to better serve our youth, our families. The more we know, the more knowledge, the more we can provide to them. We're just passing it on. Mm -hmm. But there has to be more collaboration. We are always so welcoming of partnerships, any type of, you know, um, programming that might be out there that, you know what, we can adapt and assist, you know, or participate in. 
we're always welcoming that. But at the same time, we call upon the community uh, business leaders as well. Why? Our youth need work pipelines. We need to begin to train our youth. And through agencies and programs like ours, we are able to give them that supported work. But we need the partnerships. Mm -hmm. We need the locations that give us the opportunity to place the youth there. Still on their care, right? And our responsibility, but give them those trades, those skills, right? That when they do graduate from high school, they could be, you know, better paralleled, right? To that workforce. Uh, so we definitely call upon that. Uh, more commitment, right? From our community, uh, business leaders mm -hmm. for our youth. Yeah. Yes. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with our viewers? We're always looking, you know, for amazing advocate champions. You know, um, Youth Advocate Programs always says that it's from a GD to a PhD. It doesn't matter. There is no um, one size fits all. Anyone can be an advocate if you have it within you, you know, to give back to your community. Um, all of our, you know, advocates are, are paid, you know, mentors and, and um, agents, you know, of, of future builders. But at the same time, we also want folks that will identify with, with the youth. So again, there's no right or wrong if you have it in you, you know, to want to partner with us, to want to work as, as one of our advocates or in any other way that you want to collaborate, please reach out to us. Um, we're always, like I said, very welcoming of that. Yes. Mm -hmm. How can those who are interested in participating or assisting contact you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for asking. Uh, anyone can reach our website. Um, so we have our main site, which will guide you as to, you know, what level of service you need or what information you're looking for. And um, that is www.yapinc.org. So yapinc.org or locally, you know, give us a call, you know, or if you're a local business that wants to connect with us or utilize us, um, our telephone numbers are 407-894-1708. Well, thank you so much for being here and for all the great work that you do. Thank you. Thanks. We appreciate um, you having us. Like I said, you know, the more commitment, you know, from the community we get, the better the outcomes are going to be for our families and our youth. Most definitely. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you for inviting us. Yes. Thank you. If you're enjoying this show, please subscribe to our channel and follow our Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter accounts.